Did anybody come for God's word today? Amen. Let us stand. We got quite a bit of reading to do. Quite a bit of reading to do on today. <clears throat> we want to thank God for all of our guests and returning guests. Can we make some noise for them? If they're in person or online, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you for joining us this day, this special day, where we get a chance to remember what Jesus did on the cross and celebrate that forever our lives were changed. And if nobody else, Jesus changed my life and my name is now written in the Lamb's book of life. I don't know if that book is, out, uh, is alphabetical or not, but I know I'm in there. I don't know if he's going to start from the Old Testament to the New, but I, Stefan, I know I'm in there. I don't know if he's going to start with some of y'all and let me go last because I passed at you, but I know I'm in there. I don't, I'm not worried about if I'm the first person or the last one in. As long as I'm in. Yeah, yeah. David, I'm paraphrasing, said, if I can be guard at the doorpost, as long as I'm in. If I can just be on the facilities teams in heaven, as long as I'm in there. Are you hearing me? Lord, I thank you. Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 14. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of G James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb, and, there were, and they were saying one to another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not. See the place where they did lay him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. But when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. After these things, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country. And they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. Afterward, he appeared to the leaven themselves. And as they were reclining at the table, he rebuked them for their unbelief and the hardness of heart because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace, mercy, and kindness. We ask that you be with us in the next few moments. Give us a word for your people to enlighten some, remind others, convict all that we may be convinced in who you are and what you did over 2,000 years ago. In Jesus' name, thank God. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of our Lord and Savior. Um, wonderful text that we come from today as we celebrate our uh, Resurrection Sunday, uh, this, this event that took place over 2,000 years ago. And you know, it is no argument uh, by ancient scholars about the historical Jesus. In other words, they all, for the most part, agree that Jesus was a man that lived on this earth, that he walked on this earth. This is not an argument. Only some modern people may argue this, and even then, that's not majority, that's still a minority. Not only are they in agreement that there was an historical Jesus and there's writings about him outside of the Bible and, and historical things that can be pointed to in line with the Bible, they, they also agree on two of the essential events of Jesus' life. The first one being the baptism of Jesus, that he was baptized in the Jordan water. The, the last one being that he was actually crucified, that he actually went on this process. 
Now, there also, though, are some debates um, and some differences on whether or not Jesus did rise from the dead. While many believe that he did walk this earth, not everyone believes that he rose from the dead. Some of our modern scholars will point to the scientific facts of how it's impossible for a person that was dead three days to come out of the ground or how it's impossible that that the way Jesus died, uh, uh, that 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 he didn't really die on the cross, but maybe he was actually still alive. And when they put him in the tomb, that's how he came and showed himself to was would have been bloodied and all kind of stuff and deranged. Uh, doesn't make sense, but that's a theory. Some theories that, that the disciples just made up the whole thing that they made up and they took his body at night that he was and that they took his body at night and pretended that he had rose from the dead. Uh, there are some people right now in your family that don't necessarily believe in Jesus rising from the dead. They don't argue that Jesus' teachings aren't good to de teachings, but if he didn't come out of the ground, his teachings are not authoritative. They're suggestive. They're like a good way to live, not the way you should live. And, and so reality it is there are still people even today's time frame that are not convinced convinced at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But for the believer, the Bible says what is foolishness to the world is wisdom to the believer. Paul says in Romans, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, which is the power of God unto salvation to them that believe to the Jews first and to the Greek also for there is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith for the just shall live by faith Paul paints a beautiful picture uh, he is poetic in his expression that for the believer we don't have to be ashamed of Jesus Christ the good news that he came out of the ground because he did I want to talk to you about a subject uh, that I think is going to bless your soul. And I just want to ask you a rhetorical question at first, but it's going to be a real question at the end. Can you believe? Tell your neighbor, can you believe? The reality today, the, the reason why some of us struggle with faith, struggle in our walk, struggle in our submission to Jesus Christ, we are not convinced that he came out of the ground. We don't believe. It's amazing how many Christians don't necessarily believe in the resurrection anymore. And it's because of delusion of time, the delusion of false teaching, and also the things that you went through in your own life that you believe more in their ex the experience than God's essential existence. All right? But I want to talk about can you believe to be fair. When we look at this biblical text that I just read to you today, no one believed Jesus rose from the dead initially. Not even his own disciples that spent three years with him. See, Jesus told them to the earth. He said, I come not to serve, be served, but to serve. I come to give my life as ransom for many. He talked about if, they, if, I, if I be lifted up, they'll draw all men to me. He even told his disciples that you see this temple, in three days it will be torn down, and on the third day it will be resurrected. He went even one step further, disciples. Three days, I'm going in, in the next three days, I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be, I'm going to die, but I'm going to rise from the dead. He told them this before he ever went to the cross. Peter rebuked him and said, Lord, we ain't gonna let nobody kill you. He tells Peter, before the, croc, croc, the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. Or everything Jesus said up to the point of resurrection became true. Everything happened just like he said it was going to happen. Right. But even when he died on this day and came out of the ground and rose from the grave over 2,000 years ago, this day, we find in the scripture that all of his disciples did not believe initially. They wouldn't believe. Let's go to the text. Let's read a few texts real quick. Uh, just so y'all know, I'm in this Bible here. Verses 1 through 3 of Mark 16, it says, When the Sabbath day was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome uh, bought spices so that they may, might go and anoint him, him being Jesus. Tell your neighbor they're talking about Jesus. Yeah, yeah. And very early on the first day of the week, which is today, 
when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying one to another, we, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? This question is an amazing question. The, the women of the early movement, who were Jesus' road dogs, ride or dies, they were there with him, his own ministry. We talk about the leaven, but these women were just as important as the leaven. They funded his ministry. Because Jesus said, I got no place to sleep. They made sure he had a place to sleep. They made sure he ate regularly. They took care of him. They anointed him with oil to prepare him before he went to the crucifixion. The, matter of fact, these women cried while he was on the cross. They cried until he died. Yep. Yep. But this question implies something that is in their heart. They asked the question, who will roll away the stone? The reason why they asked this question, because in their heart, they have the belief that Jesus is still in the tomb. Even though he told them they were going to, he was going to rise on the third day, you can tell that they didn't believe that he rose on the third day because they're asking a question. In good intentions, we want to take care of Jesus because we love him and we care about him. But who's going to move this stone on the tomb? Because this stone is extremely big, and it takes technology and some men to move this stone. They did not have the strength to move it. So they were heading towards the tomb, not knowing how they were going to get in there, but they just knew they had to go, talk, go take care of their Savior, not realizing their Savior had already taken care of them. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. They, they were, how do I know? Can I go one step further? So, okay, I got one, one, one person listening. <laughs> Let me go one step further. Not only does this question imply that they didn't believe Jesus rose from the dead, they took with them spices and anointment. Yeah. The, the use of spices in the anointment was an embalmment process of the body. They wanted to make sure that though his body was dead, it didn't decay quickly. Had they believed Jesus had risen from the dead, they would not have taken the spices and the anointment with them because you don't need spices and anointment for a risen body. You need it for a dead body. So here's the reality. They wouldn't believe because of what? They didn't see. They did not see Jesus come out of the grave. They did not see him out of the grave. So when they got there and the tomb was open, they were thrown off. It says their confusion seized them because all they could interpret is the death. And they wanted to be there. So they're like, for some of them were like, did somebody steal my Savior's body? Not did he get out of the ground. Right, right. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Jesus, I'm trying to help y'all. I'm blessing your soul right now. And so the, the, the angel there, they spoke to him and said, said, why do you go looking for Jesus in the tomb? Go in there and look and see he ain't in there. They went inside and saw. They didn't see no struggle. They didn't see nobody trying to take nothing. They didn't see no blood on the floor. Everything looked like a clean exit. And they said, go tell his disciples and Peter that he has risen from the dead just like he said he would. Yeah. And he's going, going ahead of them and meet them in Galilee. All right, let me go one step further. Not only did the women, the first women of the church didn't believe in Jesus' resurrection, two of his disciples not in the leaven didn't believe. The text says on the way they, two disciples, one of them named Cleopas, was traveling to the village, uh, 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 the, the, the village Emmaus. And on their way, they were talking about everything that had happened in the last week. Man, they were talking about Hosanna. Jesus came in, man, riding on a donkey just like the prophecy said he would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were putting leaves on the ground. Yeah. And they were, everybody was praising him. And man, just a few days ago, the, the high priest took him. We, we knew it was wrong that they took him unjustly they took him they lied on him we we heard about all the lies and the tricks and everything they put him in jail then they beat him then they crucified him okay let me read something to you this is their mindset they're feeling so strong about this this is what they say in luke 24 21 but we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed israel and beside all of this it is the third day since these things were done. They said, we trusted that Jesus was the one that was going to change everything right, for us. Right, 
We trusted that he was finally going to be the Messiah we've been waiting thousands of years for. And beside all of this, it's the third day and we don't see him. Evidence that they did not initially believe that Jesus rose from the grave. Now, side note, let me preach to y'all real quick. Um, side note, the reason why some of y'all don't believe is because you don't see what God has done yet. It don't mean God ain't did it, though. Tell your neighbor, don't mean he ain't did it. You just don't see it. Oh, I just blessed somebody's soul right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't mean he didn't do it. It just means you ain't seen it yet. Okay, all right. let me go one more, one, more, one more reason why they couldn't believe because of what they didn't see. His 11 apostles had the women that were there when the angel told them that he risen from the dead. They rushed to tell them. And this text says they wouldn't believe what they said. Luke says they thought they was making up a tale, a fairy tale. Because they were so hurt and traumatized by what had happened that they did not believe. Those two that walked to, that was on the road that became believers that ran and told them, and they wouldn't believe those two either. So sometimes we look at the reality that the reason why we don't believe is because of what we didn't see. Here's another reason they wouldn't believe, because of what they did see. You must remember, the last thing that they ever saw about Jesus was him being beaten, bloodied, and buried. The last thing they saw about Jesus was him being hurt, hit, being humiliated, and being hung. The last thing they saw about Jesus was him struggling, suffering, and suffocating. The last thing they saw about Jesus was him being deliberately put to death. Oh my gosh, as I'm helping you right now. And looking like he was defeated. So the trauma of minimum friend being treated that way forced them to not be able to believe that he rose from the dead. They, didn't, they, they were struggled not by only what they didn't see, but what they had seen. And that, see, this is the challenge with some of y'all. You get traumatized by what you have seen. And you say, I've seen enough that I'm just going to stay right here in this comfort zone. I don't want to believe again. I don't want to trust again. I don't want to step out on faith again. I, don't, I know God got a calling on my life, but, I, but I've been burned too many times. I've been wounded. So I'm going to lick my wounds and prevent me from having any more. I'm blessing somebody's soul right now. So what happens is they were thrown off by what they, what they did see. So much so that those two that were going to Emmaus, the Bible says Jesus pulls up next to them while they're walking. And he begins to have a full-blown uh, conversation with them about everything that has happened. And the text says they could, they, their eyes were kept from recognizing who he was. Yeah. Not because of some supernatural event, but because just because he wasn't bloodied anymore. And because they were so traumatized by what they had just seen, they could not conceive that Jesus was walking with them alive and well at that moment. They could not grasp the concept, even though the person they walked with looked like Jesus. Even though he talked like Jesus. He acted like Jesus. Had conversations and responded like Jesus. Asked questions like Jesus. But for them, it couldn't be Jesus. Yeah. It wasn't even a consideration in their minds, so much so that they blinded themselves to the reality that Jesus was walking with them. Okay, let me help some of y'all. The reason why some of you are struggling right now is that you don't recognize that Jesus is walking with you right now in your life. Yeah, yeah, you don't think it's possible for God to be walking with you right now based upon what you've been through and what you're going through. There's no way God can be with me right now. There's no way God is in what I'm going through. But I come to tell you today, if you can believe, God is right in the middle of what you're going through. Jesus ain't never left, you left. Jesus ain't never unfulfilled his promises, you just don't trust in him. Jesus ain't never changed his mind, you changed your mind. Can you believe is my question today. The text says, Luke, that, that, they, that they said, they, they said didn't our hearts burn when he talked to us? Yes. We were feeling something 
but didn't know what it was. Because trauma has a way of stealing you from being able to conceptualize what God is really doing. Hurt has a way of stopping you to see the bigger picture. Pain has a way of preventing you from being able to perceive that God has worked out his plan in your life. And the struggle with some of us today is that even though it was 2,000 years ago and God is dealing with you right now, you're wrestling because of the hardness of your heart to believe. But I come today to preach to you if I don't never see you again. A rhetorical question right now, but one you're going to answer later. Can you believe? Can you believe Jesus is who he said he is? Can you believe God is who he says he is? Can you believe that God has a purpose, promise, and plan for your life? Can you believe that today is not just another day, but it's a day that represents how everything changed for you and me? If you can believe, tell three people, I believe. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. So, so they were... They were, they were challenged not only, they wouldn't believe not only by what they wouldn't believe in, couldn't see, but what they did see. But I challenge you today, we all should believe. I want to tell you some reasons why you should believe. I want to encourage you so you know why you should believe. Here's why you should believe. Because that evidence that I just used, it's great evidence, and nobody in their right mind, if they're trying to convince you of something, will write about the, will start with it with, I didn't believe it first. Most time when somebody trying to convince you of something, they're not going to point the negative out. Amen? Right, right. They're going to just lean towards what's positive and what would be the most convincing argument. But because the, they believe much, they had no problem writing to you the truth of what happened and how they walked with Jesus and didn't believe at first. Yeah. But after he rose from the grave and showed himself multiple times, what's powerful about Jesus, we have multiple sightings of him on the earth for 40 days he walked this earth after he rose from the ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that enough people could see him to start a whole change in the world. Yeah. He did not need everybody to see him. He just needed enough. And those that did see him, they believed in Jesus. How do we know that they believe? One, by what they confessed. Because they, they were confessing that he didn't rise. we didn't see him rise from the dead. But then their confession was so strong that nobody could change their confession. They confessed that I saw the risen Jesus and that he fulfilled every promise that he said he was going to do. And we believe this. This is the power of the gospel. They confessed it. They believed it. Even though they were losing their life. Even though they were losing houses and homes. They confessed it. And they kept this confession all the rest of their life. Not only do we know and, and, and that we should believe because of their confessions that we see all through the New Testament, it's how they lived. Yeah. Their life was to please God from that point on. Yeah, yeah. Some Peter gave up his fishing business to struggle being a missionary. Matthew gave up his profitable tax collecting business. Yeah. So Zacchaeus paid back four times what he owed. Because they believed in who Jesus is. Yeah. You can't get people to give up their whole livelihood on a lie. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. I'm not about to. Get, I, after a while, you're going to go back. If they lie, they're going to only be for a while. And then eventually they're going to go back to what fed them and what they have security in. So you couldn't get for the rest of their life to live on a lie. So it's evidence that they were willing to struggle to take whatever come their way. They, they were willing, Paul was willing to be multiple times out in the ocean sitting on a piece of wood because he's in another shipwreck. Just waiting for God to save him from this ocean, this water, this sea. And as soon as he got to land, he went back to sharing the gospel again. This is how they live. They're willing to be put in jail. In Acts, it talks about how the apostles were put in the jail and they praised the Lord for they had the opportunity to be beaten for Christ's sake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
When they beat him, they said, listen, we're going to let you go. But if you preach about that Jesus again, we're going to do worse to you. And they said, whether we should we obey man or obey God, we got to obey what we know has happened. We got to speak what we know has happened. This is how they're willing to live. And then they're willing to die. Jesus told uh, Peter before Jesus died, he told him, you, you dress yourself now. But there will come a time when somebody else will dress you. He was speaking prophetically of the fact that G Peter would be killed for the, cr for the cross. That he would be killed for the gospel's sake. And that he was going to be will have to have faith. And he, he, told, he also told Peter that, that Satan desires to sift you like wheat. Satan desires to destroy you. And I ain't going to give you no money to get out of it. I ain't going to give you no land to get out of it. All I'm going to give you is my prayer that your faith don't fail you. Yeah, yeah, that's good. And Peter was so convinced and he believed so much that he had saw a risen Savior that he said, when y'all kill me, don't crucify me like y'all did him. Crucify me upside down. I'm not worthy to die the same way that my Savior died. Yes. Paul said, I'm so convinced that Jesus is real, that I'll let y'all write about the story how I first was a Jew of Jews, yeah, yeah. putting Christians in jail, breaking having people die, and I was getting ready to, I had all of the Christians scared, scared of me. He was worse than Suge Knight, y'all. Yeah. You know how Suge Knight, you know, and, and you, tell, you hear about those, those, those uh, 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 events where, where everybody having a good time in the most war ceremonies, and then Suge, they say, Suge is here. Everybody get to run, and they said, hey, flee, that all it was, scared to death of them. They were more scared of Paul than they was should night. God stops Paul on the road of Damascus while he's taking some, going, he's taking some Christians with him to go get some more. And he said, why do you persecute me? It changed Paul forever, and Paul said, now I'll be the leading evangelist to all of the world because of what he did, and I'll die. I'll go to jail. Paul, on his last letter, he writes to one of his sons in the gospel, Timothy. He says, uh, Timothy, I need you to come quickly because everyone has deserted me. I'm in this jail cell by myself. Even those I preach to, even though I minister to, nobody got time for me. But you're in the gospel, and I need you to come before winter. Winter is coming. That's before the of the throne, y'all. He said, winter is coming. And the reason why he needed to come before winter, because during that time frame, the ships did not travel in the winter time. So if he didn't leave before winter had, uh, started, Timothy would not see Paul alive again. And Paul wanted to see his son in the gospel one more time. And in his last letter, Paul writes, I have fight the good fight of faith. I have finished my course. I have laid hold to eternal life. And now it's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, but not only for me, but every one of you that's willing to suffer and give your life for Christ. This is the convincing belief that the early church had that Jesus had risen from the dead. And it's why we should believe we should believe because we have documents and we have te eyewitness testimonies of people that said, I'm not going to die for a lie, but I'll die for truth. Gee, I'm not asking you to believe. In a lie. I'm not asking you to change your life for a lie. I'm not asking you to give up your will and authority for a lie. But if Jesus did die on the cross, and if Jesus did rise from the dead on the third day, and you don't believe, you're going to have to face him one day. I ain't here to scare you. I'm here to encourage you and challenge you. Because if you ain't in the believer's seat, you need to get in the believer's seat. Tell your neighbor, get in the believer's seat. So, so understand they wouldn't believe because of the things they didn't see and the things they did see they we should believe because of the acts we saw in the early church but here's my last part um, I want to ask you a question do you believe do you believe I just want to ask you a few questions do you believe yeah, yeah I just do I got two people that really believe in this place come on I just need to know I need you to pray I need you to clap your hands not just for you but for the person that's still struggling with their belief right now why we got enough time? Why they got another opportunity? Jesus, I need you to understand this. I, I want to ask you a few questions. Do you believe that there is a God? 
Do you believe? Okay, let me read some text to you in Romans uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 19, 20. Listen to this. This is what Paul says concerning God. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his individual attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Paul says God has revealed himself to all mankind. If I go one step further, it says that they knew him as God but did not acknowledge him as God. But they wanted to do what they wanted to do. Here's what I know as a truth. I don't care if they are atheists, agnostic, spiritual, all that kind of stuff. All mankind has it built in them, an inner knowledge that God exists. It's why when an atheist person, you tell them God is real, they get so angry. Yeah. If it ain't an issue for you, why are you so defensive? Right, right, right. Wait, no, no, don't talk to me about that. It, it's why some of your family members got issues with you because you live too spiritual. Because you convinced how real Jesus is that you're willing to transform your whole life. They just want Jesus to be a genie in the bottle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus. But I need you to understand, Romans suggests that there is a God and there is evidence without excuse this universe would not exist. This universe is, everything about it is intentional, even its randomness. Yeah. I was explaining to somebody the other day that you know how you roll your dice when you're playing a game? How many of y'all have rolled dice before? You know, you, the most you roll is what? 12. There it is. Come on, good with math. One person in here. You can roll a 6 and 6. The most you can roll, as random as the dice are, the most you'll ever roll is 12. You'll never roll a 24. You'll never roll 48. As Random as they are, because it's a micro example that randomness is still intentional by God because he puts parameters in place. Yeah. Which means he gives you free choice, but your parameters of your choice still got consequences towards eternity or consequences away from God. Yeah. Are you following me? Yeah. Did you understand this? Let me go one step further. Everything is, has so much intentionality. Do you know if the, if the earth was just a few Miles closer to the sun, we could not have um, life on this earth. Right. It was a few miles away from the sun, we could not have right. life on this earth. Right. If 70 something percent of the earth is filled with water, 70 percent of your body is water. Right. 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 Do, you know, do, do you understand that all of the elements in the universe? In, this, you, in the galaxies and the clusters are all the same you, elements that exist all through the earth. All the elements on earth that make up that periodic table that you learn in school is all the elements in the whole world, in the whole universe. God is intentional that he leaves without excuse. You can look at a tree and say there's got to be a God that made that tree. You look at the animals and say there's got to be a God that made those animals. The animals never worry about what they're going to eat, but somebody always makes sure that they eat. So can you believe that there is a God? Not only that, if you can believe there is a God, can you believe that this same God cares? Yeah, yeah. And 2 Peter uh, 4, 8, 9, I think something like that, it says that God is not, not slack concerning this promise. He says a, a day with the Lord has a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. In other words, God don't operate in time. He operates in eternity. So, so the reason why some of y'all don't believe is because it's been 2,000 years and Jesus ain't came back. God, like, this has been two days. It ain't even the middle of the week yet. <laughs> y'all tripping on, I'm ch chill, chill. I'll be there in a minute. Why you want me to come early? I'm going to come when I'm going to come. Right, right, right. All, right, all right. But the reality of it is, is that what God shows us in that same text is that he's not slow concerning his promises. God ain't behind, but he is long-suffering towards us. What does that mean? Because the text says God is taking his time because he don't want anybody to perish because God never wanted anybody to die. But that all would come into the repentance and knowledge of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. The reason why God ain't came back yet because had he came back Saturday, some of y'all would have missed him. Tell your neighbor he didn't come back because of you. Yeah, yeah, clap back and say you too. Yeah, yeah, because some of y'all forgot about Jesus last night, and you thinking today getting ready to make you save. Some of you Netflixed and chilled on Thursday when Jesus was going in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You was Netflix and chilling. 
when Jesus was getting ready to get beat, you was off in the will of God. <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to get you to understand that the reason why God ain't came back is because he cares. He, he, he cares so much about who you are that he wants to give you an opportunity to say yes for real. Not yes situationally, but yes forevermore. Am I talking to you? Say amen. amen. Jesus, I need you. Do, you. do you believe God cares? If you can believe that there is a God and you can believe that he cares about you. The scripture says, for we have not a high priest that can't be touched by the feelings of our infirmities, our struggles. But, but he was tempted in every way that we are just without sin. Therefore, we can go to him boldly. I'm just going to paraphrase it. What am I saying? It's scripture is saying that it's not so much God cares what you're going through. He cares about how you feel about what you're going through. Yeah. Jesus empathizes with you. Even though you don't think he does, he really does cry when you cry. He really does feel your pain. But he's working a bigger plan. And that's my next point. If you can believe that there is a God and that this God cares about you, can you believe that he has a plan? God had a plan before man was ever created because God's ultimate plan is for him to be glorified. And so that means if there was going to be delays or detours, he already put in a plan because he never wanted us to fail, but he had to put in a fail-proof plan if we did fail. And since Adam and Eve did fail, God put in a plan. We see it in Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15 for you note takers says that God tells the serpent, I will put enmity between the offspring of the woman, meaning her children, prophesying Jesus is coming, and between enmity between you. What is enmity? Enmity is deep-seated hatred, deep-seated rejection, which means Jesus wouldn't lie. Satan and Satan wouldn't like him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody tell the neighbor the feeling, feeling is mutual. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He don't like him and Satan don't like God. And so he said, I'm going to put deep-seated enmity. And what will happen because of this deep-seated seated enmity, Satan has been trying since the, since the existence of mankind to uh, overthrow God's plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is why he did what he did with Adam and Eve. This is why God had to get rid of the whole earth because he cor helped corrupted all the people and had to reboot with Noah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is why when, when David was going through all this stuff, Satan was trying to get David to really have an unrepentant heart. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to help some of y'all. This is why he tried to overthrow Abraham. Yeah. This is why when Jesus came on the earth and Herod realized that they were talking about a Messiah he put together, how long could he have been? He probably around two years old or younger. Kill every man, every Jewish boy that's two years or younger. That wasn't just Herod. He was driven by a spirit, an anti-Christ spirit with the desire to destroy God's plan. But tell your neighbor, you can't destroy God's plan when he put in a plan. You can try to delay it. You can try to deny it. But you can't destroy it. What God said he's going to do, he's going to do. That's for two people in this room. Let me go one step further. Let me show you if you believe in plan. I'm about to give you a verse that all y'all know. For God so loved the world that he, God and son, that whoever should not perish but have everlasting life. I'm praying for the verse because some of y'all, yum, yum, yum. You don't even know John 316 no more. <laughs> bad boys, bad boy, what they gonna do? That's what some of y'all just did right now. That's what some of y'all did right now, Lord Jesus. That's all why, that's why you're here today. The text says, For God so loved the world, he thought so much of us, he put in his plan was his son. His son was to die on the cross for me and you. Why? Because legally, if it was man that put us in this mess, it got to be man to get us out this mess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So since the first Adam, the first son of God, disobeyed him, the last son of God obeyed him. The first son brought us in darkness. The last son brought us in light. The first son gave in to his temptation. The last son resisted his temptation. The first son gave his authority over to Satan. The last son took his authority back from Satan. All 
why is this possible? Because God had a plan. Jesus, God had a plan that I'm going to give the very best. I can't give money. Can't get, I can't, I can't buy, give money to get them out of this. I can't give nations to get them out of this. I can't give land to give them out of this. Matter of fact, I can't even throw the whole universe at this. The only thing I can throw at this is the most prized possession I got. The thing that means the most to me. The thing that I value the most. And that's my son. I love your life more than I love my son's death. Jesus, am I helping somebody? I love your freedom Lord, than I, more than I love his suffering. I love your victory more than I love resisting him being in pain. So therefore, I'm sending my son, that's my plan, that everybody who believes, that's the key. Because him dying on the cross is for everybody that believes. The challenge with some people don't believe. And Jesus went to the cross on a, you may give your life. You thinking about it. And I know many of y'all in this room, you not for nobody for them to think about whether or not they're going to say, honor what you did. Matter of fact, you ain't, done, you ain't going to the grocery store if they think they may eat what you're about to make. Y'all thinking about it. No, no, no. I'm not going to use all this energy. And you thinking about whether, no, no, no. I ain't about to pay for these tickets and you may not go. I'm going to stay at home. And if you, you really want to go, figure it out. Jesus. Tell your neighbor, I'm so glad Jesus is not you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell him. And I'm glad he ain't you either. Because we all be in trouble. I'm glad I'm glad I'm not Jesus because I wish you would let me be dying and suffering suffocating you say oh I appreciate what you did but I I see you I got blood in my lungs I can't breathe and I ain't supposed to be here it's your fault because I'm dying in your place let me put it another way ain't none of y'all going to jail for your your kids they did the crime do the where that at in the bible so Jesus said, though, I won't be like everybody else. I'll not have done the crime, but do the time so you'll never have to go to jail if you can believe that I died, I was buried, and on the third day, I rose. Does anybody believe that? Jesus says God had a plan. God had a plan. And, and I end with this. So what's amazing is that Jesus, the text says Jesus came and showed up to his, his 11 apostles and those that were around, and he rebuked them. He corrected them because of their unbelief and hardness of heart. He said, did I not tell y'all I was going to rise on the third day? I told you this well in advance. How is it that you don't believe? You were with me for three years. Every single day. You saw how I lived. You can't say one time I was off. You can't say one time I sinned, cussed when I wasn't supposed to, did some stuff. You saw me be celibate. You saw me honor my father. You were there in the garden when I prayed. And I prayed, Lord, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. And it wasn't like he prayed five minutes like some of y'all do. Or that little prayer right for you, Lord, be with me as I leave the house. And you on your, the door's already open, foot already, one foot already out the house. He, he didn't do those kind of prayers. For hours, he prayed so long that his disciples fell asleep. Lord, if it be, let this cup pass from me. Because even though he was 100% God, he was 100% man. And man did not want to go to the cross. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he said, Lord, if it be, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. He said, y'all, they're watching me pray. I told you what was going to happen. And you don't believe. Because your heart has been hardened by what you have experienced. But you forgot what I said. Sino, can I remind some of you, don't let your heart be hardened by what you've been through. Let it be infused by what God said and promised you. Let me say it again, because some of you have, your heart has been hardened by the things you've been through. But you should be holding on the very words and truth of what God promised you. 
Because what weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning light. Be not weary in well-doing, because in due season you shall reap if you faint not. If you don't give up, hope. If you can keep believing through all everything you're going through right now, Jesus says your latter will be greater than your first. Who am I talking to in this room? She said, I'm done with this. The text says that there was 11 of his apostles he appeared to. There was one that wasn't there. Out of all this Mark 16, there's one, that critical person that was not there. He's the one that is being the evangelist to India. He's the one that took the gospel to India. Even now, India, the people in India that are believers refer all the way back to 2,000 years ago when Thomas came and was the first person to preach the gospel to India. But the problem is you know him as Doubting Thomas. The reason why you know him as Doubting Thomas is because Thomas is the one that says, unless I put my finger in his hand and my hand in his side, I don't care what y'all talking about. He was the one that wasn't there when Jesus appeared to the others. Yeah. So what does Jesus do another time when they eating fish with hot sauce and chilling? Jesus walks through the wall. And the first person he talks to is Thomas. He says, Thomas, put your feet in my hand and your hand in my side. And Thomas says, Rabbi, I believe. But Jesus doesn't get excited. He says, you believe because you've seen me. But I had already told you this. He said, greater are those that believe in me, though they have not seen me, than those that have to see me to believe. And here's the reality. Jesus is not getting ready to show himself visually to all of us just so you can believe. But he put in place the different leaders that by their experience and their eyewitness that they were willing to die. You just look at the Bible. The Bible, if I was telling a story, I wouldn't put your negative stuff in there. Peter told John Mark right in the Gospel of Mark how Jesus said that I was going to deny him three times before the cock crows twice. I need you to write because normally my worst moments, I wouldn't let you know about it, right? right? It was Peter's worst moment. But what happens? He let them write his worst moment where he said, I don't know him. I never knew him. And come me if I've ever known this Jesus. He lets that be written about him. Because he wanted people to be convinced. As crazy as I was struggling with my faith, I'm so convinced now. He lets them write about the fact that, that after he lied three times about knowing Jesus, that Jesus, while he was in the house of Caiaphas, he was close enough. While Peter was at the fire, that after the third time he lied, him and Jesus made eye contact. Peter couldn't take it, so he ran and left. This is in the account. If I wanted you to believe a faith, I wouldn't write all this negative stuff. Right. I would only write the good stuff. Right. It's written how Paul, I told you about Paul. How Paul was going to kill all Christians and became the leader evangelist. It's written about the apostle John. Who the apostle John was the one that lived longer than everybody else. They tried to boil this man alive and couldn't kill him. Because Jesus said he ain't going to be able to die except through a natural death. So since they couldn't kill him by all the other means that they tried, they just left him on an island by himself. And instead of him being depressed, he wrote his last letter to the church called Revelations. The one y'all scared of? Yeah. yeah, yeah, but it's the one that's supposed to give you the most exciting because it's talking about how Jesus is going to return. Yeah. How he's going to come again, how he actually rose from the dead. He's alive right now. Don't give up on faith. That's what he was writing to the church because the church were losing their heads they were losing their home they were losing their family they were losing their children and they needed to be reminded one more time that what they were going through was not a waste of time that their living was not in vain that their preaching was not in vain that their teaching was not in vain that their walk was not in vain but that they could believe that Jesus came out of the ground and that he's coming back if you can believe that stand with me now let us stand Jesus.